Uh, we're just about to start, so I just wanted to welcome everyone. So whoever just joined, um, warm welcome. My name is Federica, I'm part of the DocCity team, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, legal masterclass in partnership with Peking University Schools of Transitional Law. Uh, we have our speakers connected, so I'd like to welcome Cole Agar is Director of Graduate in International Programs at Peking University, and we have the Professor Mann, is a Professor from Practice at Peking University. So we, there will be a dedicated time for all of your questions. Please use the Q&A box that you find in your Zoom window, and we will be answering at the end of the presentation. I now leave the floor to Cole, and we look forward to receiving all of your questions. Thank you, Federica, for welcoming everyone. And to everyone around the world, it's, it's great to see you here. It's great to see people from, you know, everywhere from Indonesia to Venezuela to Italy and Spain in between. And, and it's just, it's really exciting to see that breadth of interest in a topic like doing business in China. In, in just a moment, I'm gonna turn over the microphone to Professor Mann. But just before I do, I wanted to give a little introduction and background to Peking University and to the School of Transnational Law, who are bringing you this, this seminar today. So for, for any of you who don't know already, Peking University is the oldest university in China, and we're actually one of the, the top ranked universities in the world. So even though maybe the name is less familiar to some of you in different parts of the globe, it's certainly a place that is kind of driving a lot of, of academic development in, in China and about China in the rest of the world. It's also the university where you will find many of China's top leaders, top CEOs, partners at law firms graduating from. And what's particularly interesting about our new School of Transnational Law is that while the university itself is extremely old and historic, our School of Transnational Law is sort of this, this exciting new project that has been undertaken by Peking University and the tech hub of Shenzhen, which is one of the, the newest and kind of most exciting cities in China. And the purpose of that development is that as, as kind of the globe becomes more interconnected and as China's importance around the world becomes more undeniable, creating a law school that brings that all together. So we are the only law school in the world that combines uh, Western common law curriculum with a Chinese law curriculum, and then puts into that to make it more more interesting, more relevant to today, a, a high proportion of international law courses, of technology law courses, things like comparative intellectual property law. And what this means is that for someone like an international student, you could in one semester be taking a course in, you know, maybe US antitrust law and a course in foreign direct investment in China taught by Professor Mann. Um, so it's, it's really an exciting place to be. And we're excited that even for those of you who might never set foot in China, who might never get to meet me and Thomas face to face in person, that at least we can bring you something like this seminar to give all of you a little taste of the, maybe the, the types of things that you could learn at our university. And maybe for those of you who end up doing some practice with, with a Chinese client, maybe you can learn something today that, that helps you in your legal practice. Um, so I'm really excited for all of that. And, and I think with that, I will turn it over to Professor Mann. Um, Professor Thomas Mann is someone that, that I've personally known for a, a number of years now. And you know, I could tell you that he, he holds graduate degrees from some of the top universities in America and China. I could tell you that he has had academic appointments at both Peking University and the Harvard Yenching Academy. Uh, he's worked for, for years as a, as a lawyer in some of the top international law firms, including places like Baker McKenzie, Hogan Lovells, where he was a partner. But I think maybe the thing that is most telling about Professor Mann 
is that in addition to all these accomplishments that I could bore you with, he is the type of professor who is willing to stay up late on, you know, in the middle of the week to bring a, a free seminar to a bunch of students around the world interested in China. And that's very much the side of Thomas Mann that, that I have gotten to know over the last few years. So with that, I will turn it over to Thomas and I really hope you all enjoy this, this seminar and learn something. And as Federica said, if you have any questions about the material that you've heard uh, or about our program, feel free to ask any of those questions at the end. Thank you very much, Thomas, all yours. Thank you very much, Ko. I really appreciate the, your kind introduction and uh, welcome everyone. I unfortunately I cannot see uh, any of you on the screen, but I do feel that and uh, you come from different parts of the, of the globe. And I feel very, very honored to be here, to be invited by Docity. Thank you very much, uh, Federica, for organizing this. Um, as Federica said, I think it's really a tour. or she said, we can learn everything about, need to know about doing business in China uh, in 2021. Uh, it's uh, with the, the limitation of time we have, I believe I can give you a overview of the landscape of doing business in China, uh, particularly uh, FDI, uh, foreign direct investment in China. And in particular, because we come from law school, we are uh, lawyers and also I understand uh, many of you would be uh, either you are already uh, law practitioners or you want to be a lawyer uh, and you want to do something uh, with regard to doing business uh, in or with China uh, in a capacity as a legal professional. So I'm going to focus uh, mainly on uh, the legal aspects of doing business in China, in particular about how a practitioner, what kind of legal issues you are going to face uh, in China and what are the practical solutions. So with that, let me try to share my PowerPoints Let's see, uh, should be desktop one. Am I doing the right thing, Federica? Yes, we just need to put in the full screen so maybe we can see it slightly better but everything looks fine and <laughs> for whoever is connected yes write all the questions into the q a box because we will be answering at the end of the presentations yeah i was told i'm already uh at the full screen but and it's is this better yes perfect thank you so much okay thank you Federica. okay so uh as a topic uh, indicates uh, what I focus on will be doing base business in China uh, in 2021. Uh, this is overview uh, what we intend to cover if possible, mainly three subjects. First, I want to give a very brief overview of the changing legal landscape of foreign direct investment in China. Basically, I'm going to cover like over 40 years of legal development. And the second subject uh, will be um, the law and the practices in doing business in China. So we have law on the one side, but at the same time, how those laws, regulations are being implemented 
and used by business people, by government officials, and by, of course, legal professionals in the process of doing business in China. So I want to give you some kind of uh, a contrast between the law in books versus law in practice, because law ultimately is not for people just to, to read the, the provisions of law. The, people, the purpose for people to use law is to use law to solve their <clears throat> practical issues in business in particular. And the third subject I want to touch up on lawyer's role and what kind of uh, skill sets a lawyer uh, ideally should have when you want to have a successful legal career in doing business uh, in China. Uh, here I'm focused on a foreign lawyer. Not you are not a Chinese national, uh, naturally speaking Chinese, but you come from a foreign background, but you want to have the skills, uh, requisite skills to do business as a legal professional in the China market. So first, very quick overview for the last 40 years since 19, 85 through like 2015, about uh, five or six years ago. So this chart shows the, the, the growth of Chinese foreign direct investment. So we have see two uh, lines here. The first is so-called the inflow. That means the foreign uh, investment coming from foreign countries, from US, from Europe, from Venezuela, going into China. So, and the starting point is almost zero. Then you have this tremendous growth uh, since 1990. And up to today is over 120 billion US dollars. So the unit for the figures will be in billion US dollars. Another line shows the outflow, which means the Chinese investment going outside China, going to Africa, going to the United States, going to Italy, going to Spain, going to Latin America. Again, at the very beginning, almost a zero and took off in the early 90s and especially after 2000, its last 20 years. Then it grows really, really fast. Now it's almost at the same pace as the inflow foreign direct investment. Okay, that's first overview. Another one, which is the current, in terms of the amount of investment China has received uh, from outside China. And in year 2020, and actually China had overtaken the United States, as actually the largest destination for taking foreign investment. This is China here. And the US, of course, was much higher than China. But last year, we see a change of positions. China became the number one destination for foreign investment. And the figure is 163 billion US dollars. Okay. So it's a, it's a huge uh, amount of business activities with such a huge amount of capital overflow into China. So 
Now I'm going to focus on the inbound, so-called inbound uh, investment landscape in China from a Chinese perspective. So the year 2020 really very, very significant from Chinese inbound foreign direct investment development is uh, in all senses is a wash, watershed year. There were two national laws. Okay, we are lawyers. We are talking about uh, legislation. The first law, which was adopted in March 2019, is called Foreign Investment Law (FIL), and it became effective on January 1st. 2020. And from the name, you can tell it's all about foreign investment in China. Second national legislation is called a civil code. It's from people from uh, civil law countries, and we all know the Napoleon Code, the German Civil Code, and China also follows the continental law tradition and has just actually adopted its own civil code. And it became effective just at the beginning of this year, 2021. So these two national laws really becomes a very, very foundation for any business activities in China, domestic as well as foreign. So if you are a lawyer doing business in or with China, you must know at least these two national legislation. Why those two laws are so important? I'm going to put that into context in the next slides. And because from the regulatory framework perspective for foreign direct investment, those laws, two laws really represented a transformative moment. So we can see that in China, in terms of legal framework for FDI, there is an era of so-called a pre-2020 era. Then we have a post-2020 era. Why? Okay. So if you look at uh, very briefly the history of the legal regulation of foreign investment into China, we can uh, put them into like uh, four stages of development for the last uh, 40 years. First, if you know something about uh, contemporary Chinese history, and you will recall that before 1976, China was a socialist planned economy. There's no capitalism at all. No market, no foreign trade, no company, no commercial contracts. So basically everything was arranged according to a central government plan. Every commercial activity, so-called commercial activity are actually controlled, owned, arranged, conducted by government functionaries. So there were no legal system for so-called corporate or commercial transactions. Then there came the era of so-called reform and open up policy after the death of Chairman Mao in 1976. So recall that Deng Xiaoping was primarily um, the top leader of China at that time started this new policy to stir China away from 
the socialist planned economy and to open China up to foreign investment. From a legal perspective, this policy started in 1979 with the first national law guiding foreign investment. It was entitled Chinese Foreign Equity Joint Venture Law, usually practitioners call it EJV law. And think about it. That time, China had no company law, had no contract law, but they began to have foreign direct investment and China began to allow foreign investors to form companies in China to conduct business activities according to contracts. And because of this, domestic businesses at that time, there were still no company law, no commercial law, no contract law. But for foreign investment, China began to allow corporate uh, organizations and commercial contracts. So with that, they developed a separate legal regime for domestic businesses, as well as for foreign direct investment. Then the next important uh, era started with 2001, when China joined WTO, World Trade Organization. And WTO actually imposed a super national element in China's FDI regulation. And then started in 2015, China began to bring the two regulatory regimes, one for domestic businesses, another separate regime for foreign investment, began to bring them together. And the ultimate outcome is what we talked about earlier, the foreign investment law. Next slide will, sorry, I, I draw this chart by hand myself, so uh, because of the time constraints. So you, uh, here I just want to show for the last 40 years, the FDI legal framework in China has developed in this kind of a shape. Before last year, before 2020, there were separate legal regimes. This one is for domestic businesses. And this one is for FDI, for foreign businesses in China. So any lawyer who want to help a foreign client do business in China, you must know at least laws within this legal regime. But starting from last year, those two regimes converged, now becomes one. So from now on, everyone needs to know both the laws for foreign businesses as well as for domestic businesses. So that's why, as I said, foreign investment law and civil code represent actually a watershed moment for legal regulation of foreign investment in China. Okay. It's a very, very brief of review of the development of legal regime um, uh, for foreign investment. So now, uh, and let me turn to the market entry uh, policies of China under uh, this legal regime. So for any foreign businesses, either it's a company or it's an individual, 
from anywhere uh, of the of the globe. If you want to trade with a Chinese company, uh, then you can base I um, really based on what kind of business purposes uh, you have, what kind of business objectives you want to uh, attain, then you can use any of the following forms. First, you can do direct sale of your products, like you are a handbag manufacturer from France. You want to sell your Louis Vuitton bags into China. You can sell directly. Uh, to Chinese companies who will buy from you or Chinese individuals from you. So that's a direct sale. You don't have to go to China. But most businesses will find this kind of uh, way of selling their products are not really efficient. So they need to find someone either in your home country or in China or both as intermediaries. You sell those products through those intermediaries and those intermediaries either be act as your agent or as distributor. Of course, from legal perspective, there are differences between an agent and distributor. And for now, we are not going to uh, spend uh, time on that, but at least from business perspective, you can sell your products uh, or services through intermediaries. And you want to go a little bit further and you have a product designed by your company and you want to have a Chinese manufacturer to produce such products in China using the facilities the labor force in China. Then what you can do is to do a so-called contract manufacturing. You sign a contract with a Chinese manufacturer and providing them with your designs, sometimes with some raw materials, sometimes with other instructions, then the Chinese manufacturer will actually produce the products and supply the end products to you, back to you. And if you want to go another step, you want to actually establish a so-called a physical presence within the territories of China. Then, strictly speaking, you are now embarking on direct foreign investment in China because you put your capital in China and setting up your presence there. And under Chinese uh, law, such a presence will be called a foreign invested enterprise or FIE for short. Okay. So those are the main forms of doing business uh, in or with China. And of course, there are different considerations going into which form a company uh, is going to adopt. There are all business considerations, market, customer, labor, raw materials, and capital. Also, of course, economic considerations, tax, efficiency, and cost benefit analysis, of course. And from a legal perspective, you also need to take into account whether this type of investment, for example, setting up a physical presence in China is permissible under Chinese law. And sometimes some type of business are outright prohibited under Chinese law, you cannot really do that. And sometimes certain investments uh, you will be able to do, but will come with some legal restrictions. For example, you want to uh, setting up a manufacturer of 
uh, airplane, you know, aircraft, right? Uh, there will be permission, but at the same time, probably lots of uh, restrictions because there are uh, technology transfer restrictions from your home country, as well as uh, other restrictions um, from China. And other considerations, risks. There are business risks, there are IP, intellectual property protection considerations, and any political risks, and so on. And as a lawyer, you are going to work with your business uh, clients to take all of those into consideration to devise an uh, appropriate uh, approach to invest in China. Okay, next topic, very briefly, law and the practices in doing business in China. And this slide gave you a very uh, high level uh, comparison of the rule of law uh, in China. Now we're talking about legal regulation, legal restrictions, and we are talking about law in doing business in China. And the Chinese always say that uh, everything in China and will be fundamentally same as you have seen in other countries, in Europe, in America, in Africa, or Latin America, but because it's in China and everything should take up on also so-called Chinese characteristics. So in terms of law and business, what are those main so-called Chinese characteristics? First, in terms of the rule of law in businesses, as contrast to West, we are familiar with it's this concept of free market. So law, the main rule of law is to limit government intervention in business. But in China, it's a similar, but there is a different emphasis on the rule of law. In China, puts social order, so-called social harmony on top of rule of law. So law oftentimes is deemed as a tool to implement state policies. And secondly, law versus business. So when you have a business from the traditional Western perspective, you want law to be stable, certain, and predictable. So you can plan out ahead next 10 years, 20 years, where your investment will go, how your investment will uh, reap profits for the investors. In China, respect, there is a respect for such a uh, expectation, but at the same time, there is emphasis on flexibility of law in regulating businesses. It gives administrative uh, agencies a little bit larger discretion in applying the law in directing businesses. That brings us to the next contrast that's the changes of law. And traditionally in the West for the market economy and the businesses wants law to be stable because if they don't want law to change very quickly, otherwise they feel that they will not be able to plan their investment or business activities uh, for long-term <clears throat> objectives. But in China is the opposite because the law is closely connected with policy orientations. So the law changes very, very quickly. So when you are 
doing business in China and the law can be changing from day to day, week to week. So you have to be looking forward to a very fast moving legal landscape. And lastly, compliance and enforcement. In the West, of course, as general rule, there is a higher level of uniform enforcement of laws and regulations. As comparison in China, there is a higher level of selection enforcement. Very high level uh, description of the so-called Chinese characteristics of law and businesses. And this is a map uh, of China. As you will know that China administratively, there are 31 provinces and plus four municipalities directly under the central government. They are at the same level as provinces. Those four municipalities uh, directly under the central government include uh, the familiar names Beijing, Shanghai, another city called Tianjin, which is not far from Beijing, and also the, the southeast, uh, southwest city of Chongqing. And also uh, there are three separate uh, judicial regions, Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan. From a Chinese perspective, those are uh, the components of the People's Republic of China. So it's a unitary country. Everything, every law, every directive comes from top down, from the central government. It's not like many countries like the US, you have a federal system. You have federal laws, then at the local level, you also have <clears throat> state laws and those laws in different states could be very much different. In China, it's different, it's all national. Well, it's all national, but in practice, national law doesn't necessarily translate into uniform application of national law throughout the provinces. So <clears throat> for a lawyer doing business in China, you must have a very sensitive appreciation of the differences between law in books and law in practices. In terms of a formal structure, law in books, you have national laws, of course, you also have local regulations, but local regulations in China uh, from a formal structure perspective is lower level, is, is junior uh, to national laws, it's subordinate to national laws. And also uh, in terms of type of laws, you also have legislation uh, enacted by national legislature, national Congress. And you also have many administrative regulations. Again, from a structure perspective, legislation is much higher level than administrative regulations. And you have another level of contrast between legislation and judicial decisions. And China is unlike US or UK is not a common law jurisdiction. So judicial decisions do not have uh, the legal effect, the binding effect. Uh, so everything you should look up to legislation. So everything in terms of formal structure, those are the hierarchies of different kind of laws uh, between uh, laws and judicial decisions. <clears throat> but what's more important 
what you need to know is law in practice. And when you do business long enough, then you begin to realize that actually uh, in practice is a, a reverse order from the formal structure. National laws are supreme over local regulation, but in practice, actually you have to really uh, pay attention to local regulations because in terms of details, how to implement regulations, national laws, you have to follow from your day-to-day -day business. The most important thing is local regulations. And in a similar vein, administrative regulations, even though they are from a structure perspective is subordinate to legislative enactments, but in practice, administrative regulations play a much more immediate, more important uh, role in businesses. And judicial decisions, even if a judgment, judicial judgment is actually not law. However, they have practical implications for businesses. So you need to know them. <clears throat> that brings me to the next topic uh, <clears throat> for lawyers doing business in China from really a practical perspective. First, uh, from a legal profession in China. Uh, when China started actually the reform and open up policy in 1979, there were in the whole country, there were only 200 lawyers. Basically, there were no lawyers at all because there were no need for lawyers. Fast forward 2020, China already had 520,000 lawyers. And this number is also growing very rapidly year by year. And foreign law firms, for the last 20 years, foreign law firm had established their presences in China because of the high volume of business exchange between Chinese businesses and foreign businesses between, uh, because of foreign de development uh, investment in China. So last year, there were like 185 foreign law firms uh, which had uh, their offices uh, in China, which is actually a little bit reduction from the last five years. At the high point of 2016, there were over 220 foreign law firms uh, in China. As a foreign lawyer, what you can do in China? Under Chinese regulation of foreign lawyers, a foreign lawyer has only a very limited, again, in kind of formal legal perspective, a limited role because under Chinese law, foreign lawyers are not allowed to practice PRC law, PRC law, People's Republic of China. So basically foreign lawyer like myself, I'm a US lawyer. I'm admitted in Illinois of US, but I do business in China. As a foreign lawyer, I'm not permitted by Chinese law to so-called practice PRC law. What does that mean in practice? 
First, as a foreign lawyer, you cannot issue a formal legal opinion on Chinese law. For example, uh, your company uh, has invested in China for many years. Now it's ready to list itself on one of the Chinese stock market, like in Shanghai or Shenzhen. And you hire lawyers to do due diligence for your company and then to issue legal opinions. Then if you are a foreign lawyer, you cannot issue such legal opinions on Chinese law. You must have a Chinese lawyer to issue such legal opinions. Secondly, as a foreign lawyer, you cannot appear in Chinese courts. You represent a foreign company uh, in dispute, commercial dispute uh, with a Chinese company. And uh, the disputes go to Chinese courts. You as a foreign lawyer are not permitted to represent your client in Chinese court. Okay, those are the formal restrictions for foreign lawyers uh, practicing in the China market. But at the same time, a foreign lawyer can have actually a very expensive role. And except for those formal legal restrictions, not issuing legal opinion on Chinese law, not appearing in Chinese courts, you can do almost everything else. For example, you can provide advice on Chinese so-called legal environment in foreign investment. Yeah, you can do that. This is, does not consider to be practicing PRC law. You can help foreign clients in devising investment uh, programs. You draft documents, uh, conduct legal due diligence, you negotiate with uh, Chinese counterparts um, for commercial contracts and negotiate to resolve legal disputes, everything else you can do. So basically um, as a foreign lawyer and you are prohibited by Chinese law to do 13 things, but at the same time, you can do all the other things. And even for issuing legal opinion, appearing in Chinese court, uh, you can work together with the Chinese lawyer. And you don't appear in court, but actually you work with the Chinese lawyer and you direct so the litigation strategy and you only need to hire a Chinese lawyer to appear in court. So ultimately will be your client's trust and the trust will be, uh, you get hired by your client and basically you can do whatever uh, under Chinese law, which is permitted for you to do. <clears throat> what are the, the basic, uh, skill sets uh, for a successful legal career uh, in Chinese market. Ideally, what I say is ideally, uh, you want to be bilingual or even multilingual. Uh, in my legal career in China, I have seen many colleagues who actually uh, know Chinese, speak English and can read French, uh, Italian, and Spanish, and they are really multilingual. And they can, at least you need to have working level of English and Chinese. Um, so this is fundamental. But at the same time, if you say that, okay, I don't think I will ever be able to 
master Chinese at that level, that's fine. I also see a lot of lawyers, foreign lawyers who do not really uh, know Chinese that well, but they have very good Chinese colleagues who work together with them. And they have very uh, deep knowledge about Chinese law, Chinese culture, Chinese businesses, and they can be really, really successful. So in addition to language uh, skills, what you must have is the cross-jurisdiction knowledge and experiences. And for example, if you are a lawyer from the US helping US companies investing in China, you need to know the legal concepts and the structures of both Chinese and US law. And same times, you must have the ability to explain the Chinese legal concepts and procedures in language familiar to, for example, your US clients. So this is very, very important because you cannot just uh, cite a formal language of a regulation. And you have to put that regulation in a context that is understandable by your foreign client. For example, there are lots of concepts originated from different legal traditions, like a common law tradition or the civil law tradition, or sometimes uh, particularly Chinese law and versus foreign law. And then you must have the sensitivity, uh, understanding the differences between those concepts and their underlining similarities. And you will be able to explain those differences and the similarities to your clients and sometimes in negotiation to your Chinese counterpart. And this is a picture of my former colleague, Robert Lewis, uh, who is an American lawyer and been working in the China market for like almost 35 years. He speaks uh, almost perfect Chinese and uh, every uh, Chinese uh, lawyer, actually my generation uh, have either met him or heard about him. So it's a very, representative, very successful uh, foreign lawyer in the China market. And you must also have the cross-cultural perspectives on laws and businesses uh, and how the laws and businesses are actually uh, coming together in the Chinese context. So you need to know the China's position in the global economy and you should be able to put the, each project in a global contextual perspective. And of course, as a lawyer, you must develop communication skills, written skills, writing memos to your clients, explaining complicated legal business concepts, procedures, and also oral uh, skills like representing your clients in negotiating contracts with uh, Chinese business people. So, uh, Tadrika, how I do a uh, time? Yeah, you did absolutely great. There's still a bit of time to finish the presentation and actually then we are ready to move on to the questions because we received lots of questions while you were presenting. Okay, thank you very much. So probably I will basically pause here with my presentation and I will be very happy to actually to discuss any questions uh, you might have. And I understand that this is a, a far cry from uh, getting to know everything about you need to know to do this, but it is uh, only 
a very high level of, uh, of overview of the legal issues as well as practical issues. Hopefully you will find them uh, helpful. I'm Thank open you. for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. You did a great job. As you said, it's very hard to try to summarize everything. So um, moving on into the question. So one of the questions that we receive is actually regarding also to school. So it says, maybe you already said it, but what subject do you teach at the university? And then they also ask us about the thesis. So at the end of, of, of the course, if there is like a thesis, and how do you choose the topic? of your, of the work that you like to present? Uh, okay, let me, myself, uh, I, I kind of come from a, a dual uh, academic and a practical background. And I, in my research, I'm interested in constitutional law and comparative legal systems, legal process. And so I teach uh, evidence law and comparative uh, judicial systems. And also because of my uh, practical experience in helping foreign companies doing business in China in the last 20 years. So I teach FDI in China, and also I teach another course, uh, which is called, I designed myself, which is called uh, Law and the Practices in uh, cross-border transactions involving China. So, so it's uh, both theoretical and oftentimes very practical. Thank you. And maybe I can ask Cole can help us regarding the thesis part of the question. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna volunteer to expand upon that a little, and also just to say because I maybe one interpretation of that question is both what does Thomas teach but also maybe more broadly, um, what are, what's maybe the kind of the types of courses that we specialize in at the School of Transnational Law specifically. And, and what I would say is, you know, we, we have a very broad curriculum and our international students can take from any of that, but really the, maybe the areas that STL is strongest in, are areas like international law, comparative law, business and commercial law, um, you know, technology and intellectual property law, um, kind of, you know, China and, and maybe Asia related topics. So while you might find a course in something like, you know, international humanitarian law, that's not necessarily the, the focus of our law school in particular, you know, you might find a class in you know, labor law, or you will every year find a class in labor law, but something like that isn't necessarily the focus of our program in particular. Um, Thomas, I just realized maybe just to facilitate some of the question and answer, do you mind uh, maybe exiting your screen share so that if you're answering, they can see your lovely face even bigger? Um, and then in terms of the thesis, so it, essentially the way it works is unlike some graduate programs where you need to apply to the program with a thesis topic, um, we, don't, we don't operate that. We're based more on the American model uh, of a law school, which is to say you don't come into the program with a thesis idea. You may have your ideas um, but that comes later. So during your first year in the program, based on the professors you've met, the courses you've, you've developed interest in, you would think about your idea. Towards the end of your first year, you would propose a couple ideas to our, to like our, our academic committee. And based on those ideas that you've formed, you get assigned to a thesis advisor at the end of your first year and then kind of with the, the help of that thesis advisor, you will write your thesis, refine your idea, kind of edit your writing. And then towards the end of your second year, you, you finalize, you know, submit your thesis. And then if it passes, you will move on to defend your thesis. Um, so we have sort of a divide in the program where the Maybe the first year is more focused on taking courses, although you can do other things as well. 
and the second year is broader, the, the only thing you need to complete during the second year is that thesis that I just mentioned, but you can do other things. You can do an internship, you can do intensive Chinese language classes to improve your Mandarin. You can travel because China is an amazing place to travel. Um, or you can just take more courses, you know, just for the fun of it and for your, for your own enrichment. Um, so there's a lot of different things you can do, particularly during the second year of the program, if you, if you stick around in China during the second year. Perfect, thank you. We have another question from Kevin asking, what's the greatest dif difficulty for a common law trained lawyer or a current LLB student when he's interested in learning PRC laws, comparative and international law in terms of adjusting to the different mindset and system? Oh, you want to take that first? I can supplement. Sure, sure. I mean, that's an interesting question. And, you know, I, it, I think it really depends on the maybe individual student. So it's hard to speak to anyone in particular. I think, you know, so I myself, I'm a, a common law trained lawyer, right? I did my Juris Doctorate degree in the United States. But I started my career practicing uh, out of Cairo, Egypt, which is a civil law jurisdiction, uh, you know, like how China is a civil law jurisdiction. And, and so I think part of it is, at least from my experience and from some of the other kind of common law students I've seen in our program, I think when you are doing um, a civil law class, I think things can, there can sometimes be a, a, maybe a more systematic way that you have to go through something like addressing a statute. Maybe that takes some adjustment, but in general, what I would say is, you know, maybe as you've seen a little indication here, a bigger part of the focus of our program isn't necessarily that you are going to, you know, master civil law as a common law lawyer. It's that you're potentially going to gain a better understanding of civil law elements that are going to play into how you might do work as an international lawyer. Um, so while you certainly could go into a very in-depth, uh, you know, nitty gritty China law topic in one of your courses, we don't necessarily expect that you're going to come out of it as a fully proficient China law lawyer. I mean, that's very hard for a, a foreign lawyer to ever do. Um, but you'll gain kind of the exposure to, to civil law, to, to Chinese law that will make you much more proficient as a international lawyer or as a cross-border lawyer. Um, and that's more what we're trying to train the people in our program to be able to do. Thomas, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, uh, it's, yeah it's, a, it's a great call. I think it is a it's really fascinating question. And so what's really, uh, it's a, it talks about the, the core value of STL because STL is a law school in China, <clears throat> in a Chinese law, law in the Chinese university, but it has a strong program on common law. And we offer US JD program to our students. So there is a really a convergence of a common law and a civil law itself in STL. And this also actually reflects the reality of Chinese law and to a certain extent uh, laws in other countries. So like in Italy, Italy is a civil fabrica and it's a civil law country, but in many aspects, it has also taken elements of common law into the Italian traditional civil law system. China is the same thing. China traditionally is a same law, civil law uh, jurisdiction, but in particularly corporate commercial activities, actually China recent years have learned mainly from common law countries. So if you come from a common law background and you come to China, you read the statutes, but you find the concepts are actually borrowed or adapted from common law uh, jurisdictions. So it's a, it's a fascinating topic and experience by itself. 
and you will find it well by coming here, you will develop a kind of a sharpened perspective on what is the common law itself and from a comparative perspective. Speaking about um, STL, actually, we received a couple of questions more related to what could be the experience at the university. So Luca is asking us if we can tell a little bit more about the campus, if there are lots of international students, and in terms of applying to the program, if work, work experience in the field is necessary or is it fine to apply straight from the low degree? Yeah, I, I can jump in on that one. Um, so the first thing I'll say is we don't require any minimum amount of like years of experience uh, to apply to our program. Um, we do love to see when incoming students have real world experience, but I would say in a typical year, maybe one third of students that we are admitting are coming straight out of uh, a really maybe excellent LLB degree or something like a Juris Doctorate degree. Um, you know, it's great if they've done in that case, maybe moot court or clinical work or law review or something, you know, an internship, something to show that they do have some experience, but it's not required that they, you know, worked for two years. Then maybe we have another third of students who have a couple years of experience. Um, and then I'd say about one third of our incoming students are usually people with quite a wealth of experience, right? They're coming in as maybe a 30 year old who's been working as a lawyer for eight, 10 years um, and maybe doing our program is sort of their way of transitioning from being like a, a senior associate to going back to their home country and becoming the China desk partner at their law firm. Um, so we see kind of all ranges of experience. In terms of, uh, of international students um, and what it's like on campus, Actually, maybe what I'll do uh, just for fun here, since you ask about campus, um, I'll share my screen quick as I, as I answer this question, um, because I happen to have some pictures up right now. Um, let's see. Did that... Can everyone see my screen quick? Um, yes, yeah, still double, but yes, we can we can have a look. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Are you saying are you seeing both Just, presenter view and yes, regular yes, view? Yes. Yes. Just try to. I wonder. How about that? <clears throat> try to swap presenter view and yes, perfect, great, like this. Yeah. Sure. So. Uh, you know, while you're seeing, so this is our campus. Um, it's, it's a really beautiful campus, kind of right on the edge of Shenzhen. Um, although we have two metro stops right at the campus, so you can easily kind of get out, see the city, get to the train station if you want to travel. Um, there's a lot of green space and parks right on campus. Um, and we're part of a kind of a, a broader facilities where there's also our business school, uh, schools of sciences and engineering. Um, I mentioned the business school in particular because in relation to international students, um, our School of Transnational Law and the business school are the two schools on campus that have the highest number of international students. Um, we keep our LLM program fairly small and intimate. So we're maybe letting in something like 10 to 20 uh, new international students that we're bringing in each year. The business school has maybe two or three times that amount. And we're also kind of the, the, the campus is part of a whole university town. So there's actually four universities all together in that area. So there's a lot of students from kind of all over the world that you'd be mingling with on campus. Um, this is our, our law school building. Um, really beautiful building that was built, kind of, we, we just got an, a new building built uh, a few years ago, which was fantastic. Um, you know, here's our, our cafe where students will do little study groups or get, you know, coffee or lunch in between classes. Um, we have our law library, but there's also a, a giant research library. 
um, that is shared by all four of those universities I mentioned. Um, you know, we have moot court facilities and, uh, you know, both kind of bigger classrooms as well as smaller, like seminar type classrooms. Um, and one thing I'll mention just because uh, I think it was Luca, you asked about kind of specifically international students. One thing I wanted to flag is that you know, although our, our group of international students is maybe something like, you know, 10 to 20 new international students a year, um, we don't, we don't uh, kind of segregate our international students into a separate pod where you're just taking classes with other international students. Because our law school was built from the ground up with English as one of our primary languages of instruction, we have an entire curriculum that is in English. It's the same curriculum that all our Chinese students take. So in almost any class that you would take at STL, you will be sitting side by side with all of our regular Chinese students. Um, and for us, this is really kind of one of the most important parts of how we have structured the, the LLM program, because for you guys, you will both be in class learning from the teacher, but also learning from the students that are from all, you know, all corners of China. And these are also the students that, you know, within a few years of graduation are going to be taking over big businesses in China, are going to be rising in the ranks at the top, you know, international and Chinese law firms. So it kind of, you know, that, that interaction that you can have with all our Chinese students is, is really a big part of the value of the program. Thank you. Thank you so much. We still have time for a couple of questions more. So Patricia is asking us, so during your presentation, Professor, you mentioned about there are some things that foreign lawyers are not allowed to do. But does this imply that the only prohibition is to do litigation? But for example, working as a legal consultant for a company is allowed for foreigner law? Sure. And you... Uh, if you work as a legal counsel, we call it a in-house counsel for a company, and uh, you can do uh, whatever that is needed uh, in that capacity, uh, except that for yourself, you cannot appear in Chinese court and you cannot issue legal opinion. But other thing than that, you can hire a Chinese lawyer to do those two things but you can provide legal advice to draft contracts to negotiate and with uh, your company's uh, counterparts and everything else you will be able to do. Perfect, thank you. Um, Carlos is also asking us, so you mentioned that FDI and domestic law are merged and you also say the Chinese law is in rapid change. So they're asking if you think this merge will maintain or if um, FDI and domestic law will be divided once again. Uh, I think the trend is to merge those two regimes, one for domestic business, another for foreign investment business into a unified regime. And uh, I think this trend will continue and I don't think there is a need to diverge uh, those two uh, regimes again. So the, the entire, because for a separate regime for the pre-2020 years, it was actually uh, under very special circumstances. As I mentioned that at the very beginning in 1979, China had no idea about what was a company, what is a commercial contract. So, but they have to accommodate foreign investors coming to China because for a foreign investor they come there, they said that I'll, I cannot just operate under your so-called current laws and you have no contract law. Then China said this, okay, we all have a contract law, but that will apply only to a contract made by between a foreign investor and a Chinese counterpart. And for two Chinese companies, you have contracts, but this contract law will not cover you. So it was a special time, a particular period. And after 
last 40 years of gradual development and China now realize that commercial activities are common for domestic businesses as well as for foreign businesses. So that's why it's, it's natural and normal for those two regimes to merge into a single one. And this trend, I believe, will continue for the years to come. Perfect. So one other question is about continuing studying. So um, let's say coming to STL, we may offer the opportunity to continue studying with maybe for a PhD. So someone was wondering about tax matter, for example. Cole, you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of a, a short answer. Um, so at our School of Transnational Law, we do not currently have a PhD program. Um, we do have students who, after finishing their studies at STL, mm -hmm. will go on to, uh, to our, our main campus facilities to do PhD. Uh, it's not too common, but, but we do have some. Perfect. So we're coming towards the end of our presentation, and I wanted to thank Cole and Professor Mann for the presentation. But before um, closing our event for today, I wanted to ask if there was anything else that you wanted to add to the audience. And I know there were still some questions that we maybe didn't have time to answer, but we will share them with the speakers. And of course, we hope that you actually will be able to meet Cole and Thomas, perhaps in person. So if there is anything else that you wanted to add regarding you know, the topic or also the school, we will be following up with an email, but I just leave you the floor in case if there is anything else that you wanted to say. I'll call you one. Okay, I will go first. <laughs> yeah, I, on my part, I, I apologize for the shortness of my presentation because I really, there are so many things I want to cover. And one thing I feel that I will not be able to bring about is because many of professors, including myself and STL, uh, have actual practical experiences. We have lots of uh, so-called case studies, war stories, like the cases I represented uh, in my practice. And in my class, I Oftentimes, I will share with my students uh, so-called war stories, and but today I will not be able to do that. But hopefully, in the future, when you come to STL, I'll be able to share those stories with you. I guess the final thing I would say is, it's it's really just an amazing time to have any sort of experience in China. Um, you know, I mean. There's a whole side discussion of whether you are pro-China or against China. For some reason, the world seems feels like it's necessary to push people into those sorts of camps these days. But wherever you fall in that discussion, or if you're just not even interested in engaging in that discussion, it's really it's it's a country that is impacting almost every part of the world right now, whether it's in environmental regulation and concerns, or obviously things like international trade and business, there's almost no part of the world and no area of law that China isn't having an important impact on right now. And, and so kind of with that in mind, the, you know, the really the only way to actually understand how, how big and complex a place like China is is to put yourself there on the ground, right? Is to see it for yourself, to, to learn about it from the people who are there and, and to draw your own conclusions. Um, so I hope that for any of you who maybe got a, a little glimpse of Chinese law from, from Professor Mann's presentation, for any of you who are curious to learn more, um, you know, consider emailing me if you have any questions that you want. And if you want to apply to our program and to get much, much more knowledge about all these issues, um, our deadline is coming up uh, for, for next year in March, uh, end of March, March 31st. Um, but we really encourage people to apply early if you're interested in things like getting scholarships. Uh, we waive the, the uh, application fee for anyone who applies early. 
And if that's something that interests you, get in touch with me and me or one of my colleagues can help you through the whole process. Um, otherwise, thank you to Federica and Doxity for helping to organize this event. And thank you most of all to, uh, to Professor Mann for giving us his time and to all of you for, for showing up and hopefully learning something today. Thank you. I really wanted to thank you, Cole, and the Professor Mann for your time for the presentation. We will be sending you an email. So Cole put this email address in the, in the chat. So any sort of question that you might have after the event, feel free to send it over. We also send you a recording of the event. So in case you know you want to rewatch it because you want to make sure that you got everything, please um, check your inbox. And I'm just going to put a link here in case you would like to receive a certificate of attendance. So again, thank you so much to the professor man to call for your time and all of you for staying connected and for all of your interesting questions. We look forward to seeing you soon at the next live event at Peking University. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye now.